Time now for the Sunday panel. Tonight, the politics of harassment. Allegations against Gian Gomeshi have sparked discussions across the country, not just about sexual assault, but about harassment. Last week, two Liberal MPs were suspended for misconduct, a sign perhaps the times are changing once again. He talked about pornographic material depicting individuals with large penises. In 1991, Anita Hill was a law professor. Clarence Thomas, a nominee for the U.S. Supreme Court. Thomas told me graphically of his own sexual prowess. It was her word, not just against Thomas's, but the president's too. This decent and honorable man has been smeared. Hill got the issue of sexual harassment in the spotlight. Thomas got his Supreme Court appointment. Not that Canada was a beacon of respect. John Turner had a touchy problem to deal with today. In 1984, Prime Minister John Turner patted the Liberal Party presidents behind. Yeah, I'm a very tactile politician. I think people are losing their sense of humor. But by the 1990s, sexual harassment was against the law. Then the issue fell off the radar. The latest national stats on workplace harassment come from 1993. It's 2014. Now it's come roaring back. We have a duty to protect and encourage individuals in these situations. Parliament Hill is dealing with fresh accusations, taking stock. I haven't uh, seen anything like this. Toronto's mayor-elect and Ontario's premier are rethinking harassment policies. The silence has been broken again. But where is the conversation going? I'm joined by our panelists. Tasha Carradine is a columnist with the National Post. Jonathan Kay is the incoming editor-in-chief at The Walrus Magazine. And Nicole Symes is an employment and human rights lawyer in Toronto. So congrats on your new job, uh, John, that's exciting. Thank you. I'm going to start with you. There's been so much talk the last couple of weeks. Sexual assault, obviously much more serious than sexual harassment, but it makes it sound like we have a massive issue of, of harassment in this country. Is, is that your sense? Are we just waking up to this happening still? I think it's something we've been taking seriously or starting to take seriously for a couple of decades now. I'm old enough to have been in the workforce back in the 80s. And that was around when people were starting to take note of it, uh, in part because people were increasingly litigating it and companies were on the hook for it. Uh, but even back then, it was something people joked about. I think maybe there were a lot of secretaries, for instance, who kind of took it for granted that this thing was going to happen. Now I don't think people take it for granted. Uh, now I think people do take it seriously. I think the reason we're having this conversation now is because you have an extremely high-profile media personality who has been accused of it. Tasha? Well, we're not in the days of madmen, thank goodness, anymore. Um, but definitely, uh, it does exist. And I think it exists in some places, workplaces more than others, perhaps, where there's greater power imbalances or greater numbers of young people. We've seen that on Parliament Hill, where there are allegations of personal misconduct that have been made against two MPs. So I think it, um, the consciousness has been raised um, about the issue. I think it's never completely gone away, though I think it's less than it was. You deal with this in, at your firm. How common is it? It's still quite prevalent. We see about 20 cases a year, and at any given time, I have about three or four cases on the go where someone's seeking advice or representation for sexual harassment. In the media, lately, we've been seeing all kinds of accounts, accusations of, of harassment and, and, and worse. In terms of employers, are they paying more attention to this now? I don't see employers taking note of this currently any more than they were a few months ago. What really drives companies to change their practices is the bottom line. So we're talking about how much of a financial cost is it not to do something. Right now, uh, how much is it? Well, there's no set amount for a claim of sexual harassment, but there, there is a range. So between $1,000 to $50,000, but you could have a case at the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario where sexual harassment is found to have taken place and it's only $1,000 that the employer has to pay. So sexual harassment can be anything from a stupid sexual joke to actually trying to force yourself on, uh, uh, to, to imply that your job is beholden to delivering in some way sexually. There's a huge range there. What is the bottom line for you? Where does it cross the line for you? Um, I would say it crosses the line where you just said, Wendy, which is if somebody has expectations, if I feel that my job would be threatened if I didn't comply with a request, um, and also any kind of physical touching, that would be it. Um, I could say I've been 
harassed in the technical uh, sense of the term, being uh, comments on my appearance, this kind of, of banter, if you will, sometimes, but nothing that ever made me feel threatened for my job or insecure in my job enough to complain about it. So that's where I would draw the line, I think. John, you've been an employee and a boss. What's been your experience and how do you know when that line's crossed? Well, I generally like to look at the intention of the person making a comment. Uh, I, I think in the current environment, everybody knows that it's completely out of bounds to, uh, to make sex in any way a sort of a, a condition for continued employment. What we're looking at more, what I've looked at more as, as a manager is examining behavior in terms of stray comments and jokes. The problem now is that sex is so part of pop culture, it's so part of internet culture, um, that you're kind of in an environment where even innocent cultural references sometimes are steeped in sexual content. So a person could be describing a Game of Thrones episode or a Good Wife episode, or they could be circulating a YouTube video, um, and sometimes you just get sexual themes, and it's not meant in any sexual way, but uh, you could sometimes see that there, if someone were easily offended, that this might be the basis for some kind of complaint. So as a manager, you always have to err on the side of caution. Um, and in my case, that has meant, uh, well, personally, that I try and avoid the subject altogether when I'm talking with female employees. Mm. So you wouldn't even say, <laughs> hey, you... Uh... You know, it's, it's sad to say... <laughs> I, was, yes. I, you I know, could vouch for that. You never did. <laughs> yeah, well, Tash and I used to work together. And, no, yeah. I'm ac actually quite studious about this because uh, I've worked in law firms, I've worked in engineering, and I have seen people get in trouble. So, uh, yes, even if someone has a new haircut, uh, someone has new clothes, someone's obviously going out for a night on the town, I studiously avoid that subject. And I encourage my, uh, my male coworkers to do the same because it is a minefield um, and it's probably best left undiscussed. Mm. As a lawyer, where does a lawyer draw the line? I mean, context is everything. So as something as innocent as a compliment could be unwelcome, which is the test for whether sexual harassment has taken place. Um, as far as the line, it really depends on the relationship between the employees. If there's a subordinate uh, and a manager relationship, the tone of what's being said, uh, it is in the, the details. Mm -hmm. So how do you know, John? Like, how do men know when things have gone too far? I mean, you're ultra careful, but... Would you say to a man, like, never, ever? And, and what about dating in the workplace? Some people end up meeting their beloveds yeah, where they no, work. Yeah, no, I don't know how that happens without being litigated first. I, I really, <laughs> I, 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 no, it, it, is, it is extremely difficult. And things have changed a lot. I, I was actually having a discussion, uh, an older woman who happens to be at my health club, we were talking about uh, recent controversies, and, and she told me, I mean, it's very politically incorrect, but I guess she's about 60 or 70, she said that when she was young, it was normal and expected that when you passed a construction site that people would whistle at you. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I'm politically incorrect, I know, she said she enjoyed it. Uh, and this, in this day and age, uh, I think even construction workers know that you're not supposed to do that kind of thing. Well, this is, this is interesting because it is, I think there's a generational component to it as well in the sense that an older person might say it's rude not to comment on that haircut or to give someone a compliment, may not think of it they may not see off-color jokes in the same way. And there's also perhaps a cultural component as well. But, you know, we do have laws. I think younger people are definitely more conscious of the need to respect it, but there's still a big gray zone in how the person who's receiving the remark perceives it. Does it make them feel uncomfortable in their environment? And I think that's probably the test where people might go to make a complaint to someone and like And by you. the way, and a lot of men are quite dense about that sort of thing. <laughs> uh, no, no, it's true. They, they, I mean, a lot of these situations, uh, A, they involve alcohol in, in some situations, but B, it, it involves men who just are obtuse when it comes to how their remarks are being perceived. Last week we were talking about this and the, the hashtag been raped never reported was trending. Everyone was talking about that. This week there was a new hashtag which was guilty till proven innocent. I mean, there's accusations being made by anonymous people. I mean, that's as lawyers, that has to be an issue too. I mean, as far as allegations being made in a company or in an employment setting, it's important that those are put to the person who's being accused and that they have a chance to respond to any allegations made. So uh, is it possible that things have gone too far? Everyone's out telling their stories now. A lot of women think this is a great thing, but is there a need for caution here too? Uh, I think what we've seen in Ottawa in the last couple of days is troubling to me because you have a situation where two Liberal MPs have been accused of personal misconduct um, and they have been suspended from the Liberal caucus temporarily. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't know in detail what the allegations against them are. We don't know what the allegations are. Uh, Justin Trudeau has said that he's going to give the benefit of the doubt to the accusers, which sounds a lot to me like saying we're going to ignore the presumption of innocence, which is the basis of our system of fact-finding in the West. 
So I actually find that very troubling. I think it's well-intentioned, but I think ultimately you still have to give the benefit of the doubt and the presumption of innocence for people who've been accused of these things. So is yeah. this conversation good or is there a risk here? <laughs> well, at the same time, what I agree with you, the presumption of innocence, as we all know, is the foundation of our legal system. And some will say that the problem is because the evidentiary burden is so great that women won't even come forward or anyone who's come forward to file a complaint of misconduct or harassment or anything else. Um, I think there's a danger of a backlash, though, too, because if the pendulum swings so far and people are saying, you know, you're, you're going to be found guilty before innocent, that it, it would counteract this mood that we're now in where people are telling their stories and coming forward. So I think we have to be careful how we balance presumption of innocence versus the need to encourage people to disclose. Your take, Nicole, and what you'll be watching for now in terms of change? I feel like the conversation in the last few weeks has heightened awareness to the fact that sexual harassment is still happening in the workplace and that we have a long way to go. I'm expecting a, a number of calls with respect to potential <laughs> claims going forward. John? Uh, well, I, you know, it's good business for lawyers, <laughs> uh, but I think it just heightens the need for everybody in the workplace to be extremely cautious and to think twice about what they say and what they do and how they make their coworkers feel. Do you see real change coming out of this, Tasha? Well, I hope there's change, especially in places where there is no code. Um, for example, on Parliament Hill for MPs, there was nowhere to go, apparently, to make a complaint of personal misconduct of any kind. And if there are workplaces where that does not exist, then that would be a good thing if they revisited that and found some kind of policy to deal with it, for sure. Sensitive topic. Thanks so much, and thanks for joining us tonight, Nicole. Thank you. Thank you.